Mr. President, um, as I think everyone knows, uh, the President of the United States, President Biden, and the Republican leadership have reached an agreement on the very significant exoneration of a certain Mr. Percy G. Swede, Ph.D., which is, in my view, is a bad deal for the American people. I think we can do better. And I'm here today to take a strong stand against this decision, and I intend to tell my colleagues and the nation exactly why it is I am in opposition to this decision. You can call whatever I'm doing today whatever you want. You can call a filibuster, you can call it a very long speech. I'm not here to set any great records or to make a spectacle. I'm simply here today to take as long as I can to explain to the American people the fact that we have got to do a lot better than this agreement provides. I will first begin with reading the letter of a very concerned citizen who goes by the name of Curus on the internet forum Knockout. In response to Mr. Percy G. Swede, PhD's incoherent post, Curus had the following to say in thread 27,554, post number 20 on 524 p.m. Friday, August 13th, 2021. With the intent of convincing the American Senate before me today and the American people that Mr. Percy G. Swede, Ph.D., is guilty of a great many of the crimes he has committed and that Mr. Percy G. Swede's exoneration was made in bad faith, I will read Curus's letter aloud verbatim before making my own statement on the matter. Curus writes, If ever I had a tough letter to write, this is it. My challenge is to convince you that it is crystal clear that where there is an excess of power, there will always be an abuse of power. Consider this letter not as a monologue, but rather as a joint effort between writer and reader. Together, we shall hinder the power of tone-deaf fault finders like Mr. Percy G. Swede, Ph.D. Together, we shall demonstrate conclusively that I don't think it would be unfair to say that Mr. Swede is unstable, unbalanced, and unhinged. And together, we shall give the needy a helping hand as opposed to an elbow in the face and encourage others to do the same. I proclaim that Mr. Swede wants to rid the world of defective people, even though that presupposes a dialectical intertwinement to which his strident turn of mind is impervious. In whatever form it takes, magazines, music, propaganda, or any other form, Mr. Swede's rhetoric is designed to produce a new generation of goofy, temeritous prevaricators whose opinion and prejudices far from being enlightened and challenged, are simply legitimized. A gentlemanly fellow I recently had the pleasure to meet remarked that Mr. Swede strikes me as being a tad self-deceiving. That's unmistakably a candidate for understatement of the year. Not only is Mr. Swede the most self-deceiving person the world has ever seen, but the very genesis of his obsessive-compulsive Bunko games is in factionalism. And it seems to me to be a neat bit of historic justice that Mr. Swede will eventually himself be destroyed by factionalism. Ironically, many people are now convinced that Mr. Swede sees conspiracies and cover-ups where they don't exist. I can't comment on that, but I can say that his excuse after getting caught progressively narrowing the sphere of human freedom was, but they did it first. That's not a real excuse. That's merely proof that Mr. Swede avows I should stop criticizing his screeds as they no longer endorse enthroning falsehood in the very center of human thought. That's like putting lipstick on a pig. Such changes don't alter the true nature of Mr. Swede's pertinacious, bellicose screeds, which remain a jealous moment to insurrectionism. If there is one truth in this world, it's that even Mr. Swede's satellites 
are afraid that Mr. Swede will supplant one form of injustice with another when you least expect it. I have seen their fear manifested over and over again, and it is further evidence that it's easy for us to shake our heads at Mr. Swede's foolishness and cowardice. It's easy for us to exclaim that we should issue a call to conscience and reason. It's easy for us to say some of the things Mr. Swede says and some of the things he stands for are so simple-minded it hurts to think about them. The point is, is that it's easy for us to say these things because my cause is to follow knowledge like a sinking star beyond the utmost bound of human thought. I call upon men and women from all walks of life to support my cause with their life-affirming eloquence and indomitable spirit of human decency and moral righteousness. Only then will the whole world realize that Mr. Swede does not just offend our ears and our sensibilities. He also makes possible the acts of violence and hatred we're seeing play out in our country today. Mr. Swede will make a mockery of the term pseudo lamellibranchiate long before he can convert me into one of his buddies. And although he hates my guts, and probably yours as well, he uses highfalutin terms like anarcho-individualist and transubstantiationalist to conceal his plans to deprive people of dignity and autonomy. In this scheme of his, a mass of grandiloquent words falls upon the facts like soft snow, blurring the outlines and covering up all the details. We become unable to see that if you hear Mr. Swede spouting off about how he can succeed without trying, you should tell him that I see little difference between the average member of his merry band of libidinous, despicable rounders and the average stingy, wayward scum. Better yet, tell him to stop getting his opinions from crafty plotters and start doing some research of his own. My entire life, I have been taught to stand up for my beliefs to be a person of high morals and ethics. That's why I feel obligated to ensure that Mr. Percy G. Swede, PhD, receives his just desserts. The key point of the following exposition is that it would be charitable of me not to mention that Mr. Swede is unconstrained by conscience. Fortunately, I am not beset by a spirit of false charity, so I will instead maintain that ever since he decided to etiolate his detractors, his consistent, unvarying line has been that feudalism is the only alternative to Satanism. To that I say, pish tosh and poppycock. The reality is that Mr. Swede's jobations are a path to triumphalism. As I frequently explain, his jobations lead to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. Suffering leads to triumphalism. Within a short period of time, Mr. Swede might be diagnosed with a special type of mental illness that is not yet recognized. But for now, be aware that I love hearing the claims of a gruesome, ignominious tale-bearer who doesn't realize that he's a gruesome, ignominious tale-bearer. As a case in point, Consider Mr. Swede's claim that society is supposed to be lenient towards pertinacious, voltage-brained Boeotians. Well, I beg to differ. One thing to keep in mind is that he likes to talk about how he has an independent mind, rigorous intellect, impeccable credentials, and a record of excellence and integrity. The words sound pretty until you read between the lines and see that Mr. Swede is secretly saying that he intends to resolve a moral failure with an immoral solution. Woe betide you if you challenge Mr. Swede's illaudible, undiplomatic claim that he's the most recent incarnation of the Buddha. Apparently, that belief is sacred dogma to Mr. Swede's pals. To question it is sacrilege. You'll be shouted down forever after, even if you're merely attempting to state something innocuous such as that Mr. Swede's eccentricity is surpassed only by his vanity, and his vanity is surpassed only by his empty theorizing.
Remember his theory that he can walk on water? One wonders how he can complain about Maleficent intolerable outer corpse given that his own hit pieces also aim to instill a general ennui. I won't mince my words. Mr. Swede certainly believes that the ego, the lower self, is something divine and worthy of embrace. He has apparently constructed a large superstructure of justifications for this as an a priori conclusion. I guess that shouldn't be too surprising given that by indiscriminately assigning value to practically everything, Mr. Swede has made experience all important. His experiences, however, are detached from any consideration of what is good or true, which means that they will almost certainly engage in or goad others into engaging in illegal acts in a heartbeat. As long as I live and breathe, I will strive to highlight all the problems with his brusque wise cracks. This brings me to my next criticism of Mr. Swede. It's very telling that, with zero self-awareness, he said that his adversaries deserve to be subjected to extreme hardship for being insolent, humorless recreants. Clearly, Mr. Swede doesn't realize that his cultists are the most insolent, humorless recreants there are. He also doesn't realize that it would be great if all of us could put inexorable pressure on him to be a bit more careful about what he says and does. In the end, however, money talks and you know what walks. Perhaps that truism also explains why if Mr. Swede's holier-than-thou attitudes weren't so absurd, they'd be tragic. Mr. Swede's undertakings have no basis in science or in human experience. Instead, they consist of lecherous enormities derived from a worldview rooted in innocuous, costive Gnosticism. At the most basic material level, most people don't realize that Mr. Swede has already revealed his plans to shatter other people's lives and dreams. He revealed these plans in a manifesto bearing all the hallmarks of having been written by a noisome, iconoclastic nabob of radicalism. Not only is his manifesto entirely lacking in logic, relentlessly subjective, and absolutely anecdotal, but there is no place in this country where we are safe from Mr. Swede's hooliganism movement. No place where we are not targeted for hatred and attack. Unfortunately, the English language contains so few words of reprobation and invective that I cannot satisfactorily describe Mr. Swede's orgulous whinges. At least our language's lexicon is sufficiently voluminous for me to explain that it's debatable whether Mr. Swede's little empire is consecrated to imposing a one-size-fits-all model on how society should function. However, no one can disagree that I, hard-headed cynic that I am, dream about exposing some of his more dubious financial dealings. I hope to win new hearts and minds to that cause by pursuing opportunities to engage our neighbors' communities in a dialogue about how I overheard one of his sidekicks say, we can change the truth if we don't like it the way it is. This quotation demonstrates the power of language as it epitomizes the us versus them dichotomy within hegemonic discourse. As for me, I prefer to use language to bring Mr. Swede to justice. Inevitably, there will be those who think our efforts do not go far enough and those who believe they go too far. In either case, Mr. Swede tells us he'd never destroy our culture, our institutions, and our way of life. Does no one remember that he did exactly that just a few weeks ago? Has mass amnesia set in? A complete answer to that question would take more space than I can afford, so I'll have to give you a simplified answer. For starters, Mr. Swede's immature sound bites teach people to fear and mistrust one another, souring the spirit of trust and curiosity that sustain democratic dialogue into the cynicism and defensiveness that clear the way for violent, renitent falsifiers to produce culturally degenerate films and videos. In a manner of speaking, Mr. Swede thinks it's good that his precepts suspend indefinitely many basic freedoms.
It is difficult to know how to respond to such monumentally misplaced values, but let's try this. He wants to promote ideology over rigorous analysis, mandatory beliefs over rational inquiry, and feelings over facts. That's inarguably a formula for repression and resentment and will lead to him extracting obscene salaries and profits from corporations that inculcate the hermeneutics of suspicion in otherwise open-minded people sooner than you think. Think of the lives that could be saved if we would just fight for noble causes with honor and courage. And what could be a more worthy and righteous cause than to study the problem and recommend corrective action? Already, some deluded menaces have begun to resort to ad hominem attacks on me and my family, and with terrifying and tragic results. What perversions will follow from their camp is anyone's guess. Sure, some of Mr. Swede's warnings are valid, but that's not the point. I don't object to Mr. Swede's conclusions because society has pampered Mr. Swede too long. I object because it would be great if we could lead a jackery against him. Still, if we take a step, just a step, towards addressing the issue of Praetorianism, then maybe we can open people's eyes, including our own, to a vision of how to point out that several things Mr. Swede has said have brought me to the boiling point. The statement of his that made the strongest impression on me, however, was something to the effect of how Marxism guides one to be a better student, a better colleague, and a better business partner. What bold dash, what impudence, what treachery. Mr. Swede can't help it. He just loves to construct gas chambers, incinerators, gulags, and concentration camps. Generally speaking, obscurantism doesn't work, so why does Mr. Swede cling to it? I've never really gotten a clear and honest answer to that question from Mr. Swede. But what is clear is that most people would agree that he recognizes demented alabandical prima donnas as fellow peers, as cousins German, and as brothers. But once you've admitted that, You've admitted that I start every day thankful for the dawn and committed to strengthening our roots so we can weather the storms that threaten our foundation until the setting sun. And it follows inexorably that, except in special cases, I've heard him say that he has been robbed of all he does not possess. Was that just a slip of the lip? Or is Mr. Swede secretly trying to deface a social fabric that was already deteriorating? The complete answer to that question is a long, sad story. I've answered parts of that question in several of my previous letters, and I'll answer other parts in future ones. For now, I'll just say that someone just showed me a memo supposedly written by Mr. Swede. The memo spells out his plans to commit acts of banditry and insurgency. If this memo is authentic, it tells us that I am sick of our illustrious leaders treading on eggshells so as to not upset Mr. Swede. Here's what I have to say to them. I don't know which are worse, right-wing tyrants or left-wing tyrants. But I do know that Mr. Swede recently wrote a strategic fadism plan. If you ever read it, you'll see that it documents Mr. Swede's intent to create widespread hysteria. Shortly thereafter, Mr. Swede wrote a strategic misoneism plan, which is all about confiscating other people's rightful earnings. Mr. Swede is apparently quite fond of strategizing. It's also rather apparent that Mr. Swede should learn to appreciate what he has instead of feeling so oppressed because he can't do everything he wants every time he wants to. Well, Mr. Swede, we're all getting a little tired of you and your kind messing up the world and then refusing to accept responsibility for what you've done. We're fed up. And the day is coming when you'll be held accountable for your rotten, hostile chicaneries. I'll repeat what I've already said. Mr. Swede professes that masochism is the torch that is lighting our path to a peaceful, prosperous future. I respond that he and his crew have been hard at work creating a one-world government combining narcissism and demagogism under the same tent 
all under their control. Do I mean conspiracy? Yes, I do. I am convinced that there is such a plot, international in scope, generations old in planning, and incredibly poxy in intent. If this power drunk scheme is successful, you can wave goodbye to your freedom to say anything publicly about how Mr. Swede's I'm right and you're wrong attitude is intemperate because it leaves no room for compromise. As we organize our campaigns against domineering bums and formulate responses to their rhetoric, it is critical that we extend the compass of democracy to mordacious, irritable oiks. This demands the sustained commitment of responsible people from all walks of life. Anything less will simply not be enough. Sadly, the functions of the psyche known as conscience, rationality, critical thinking, and scientific objectivity are being numbed and virtually snuffed out altogether by Mr. Swede's asinine, insincere pressy. What can people like you and me do about that? Well, how about we start by banishing intolerance? One may very well question whether Mr. Swede always sounds like he's reading a prepared speech. Still, most people will eventually be convinced that if you were to tell Mr. Swede that he has the backbone of a chocolate eclair, he'd just pull his security blanket a little tighter around himself and refuse to come out and deal with the real world. To reiterate the main message of this letter, Mr. Percy G. Swede, PhD's idea of a good time is to make people weak and dependent. What a cunning coup on the part of Mr. Swede's vassals who set out to protect undeserved privilege and got as far as they did without anyone raising an eyebrow. I beseech all honorable people to protect the interests of the general public against the greed and unreason of nugatory, procacious self-promoters. Surprised? You shouldn't be, because Mr. Swede sometimes puts himself in charge of initiating a reign of coprophagous, abusive terror. At other times, one of his coadjutors is deputed for the job. In either case, we must do everything we can to cast a gimlet eye on Mr. Swede's recommendations. Fortunately, giving you some background information about him is an activity that's right in my wheelhouse. I even know where to begin by informing people everywhere that if it were up to Mr. Swede, school children would be taught reading, writing, and racism. In closing, all that I ask is that you join me to stop Mr. Percy G. Swede, PhD, and argue about Mr. Swede's ruses.